This is video number two in our series about myopia, covering potential complications that can threaten vision. Myopia has long been recognized as a cause of blurred distance vision, but it is being increasingly recognized for risk of complications which can result in vision loss. For example, retinal detachment and myopic macular degeneration. In other words, because the blurred vision of common myopia is corrected by simple measures like glasses or contacts, it is generally underestimated as a cause of vision loss. In 2013, the leading cause of blindness worldwide was cataract, and not far behind uncorrected refractive error, which means myopes without distance glasses and presbyopes without reading glasses. Regarding moderate to severe vision impairment, uncorrected refractive error accounted for a little more than half. Such reduced vision impact people's daily lives, like school performance and job productivity. In our exploration of myopia, we break it down into five different subjects. In number one, we discussed what myopia was and how widespread it was around the world, with East Asia in particular reaching epidemic levels. Our plan for this video is to review the complications associated with myopia, ask how often they happen, and what impact they have on vision. We begin with a brief review of what is myopia. If you have watched video one, you can skip ahead to the next section on structure and pathology. In the sense that your eye works like a camera, if you had ideal vision, light rays from a distant object would come to a focus and make a sharp image on the retina in the back of the eye. The cornea and lens in the front of the eye act together to supply the focusing power. To form a sharp image, the focus distance must be a match to the length of the eye. This ideal is called emetropia. To the extent eye growth gets off track, the eye can become near or farsighted, usually hyperopia resulting from a too short eye and myopia from a too long eye. The amount the eye is out of focus is called the refractive error. The power and sign of the lens needed to bring the image into focus is called the refractive correction. Correction is measured in diopters shown on the number line. Hyperopia correction is in plus numbers here to the left of zero. Myopia correction is in minus numbers to the right of zero. Regarding myopia, most studies specify that myopia formally starts at a spherical equivalent of minus 50 diopters, but some start at minus 0.75. Most studies categorize minus 50 to minus 3 as mild myopia, minus 3 to minus 6 as moderate myopia, and greater than minus 6 as high myopia. These divisions are based on both reduced vision and complication rates. We have color-coded myopia levels as tan, gold, and orange, which will continue through the presentation. As an example, showing increased risk of retinal detachment with higher levels of myopia. To understand myopia consequences, we need to understand the general structure of the eye. Then we can connect that to the pathology, the damage done. Because this is a complicated subject, we will do an introductory summary before proceeding in detail. This is a concept diagram of the normal eye. I have exaggerated the thickness of the layers to make them easier to see and showed them of even thickness. Landmark locations are like on any globe, this one on its side. The posterior pole at the very back of the eye and the equator midway to the front. The innermost layer is the retina, a layer of nerve tissue that acts like film in a camera. Under that is the choroid, a layer of blood vessels that supplies the outer retina with oxygen and nutrients it needs to function. The outside is the sclera, a tough fibrous layer that gives the eyeball its structure. Myopia issues all begin with the sclera. The eye of a child destined to become a myope starts out normal but as it grows, the sclera thins, particularly at the back, allowing it to stretch 
slash elongate. In turn, the thinned sclera is associated with thinning of the choroid and retina and their associated complications. First, the elongated eyeball results in refractive myopia. Second, the thinned, weakened sclera is also vulnerable to local bulging, called a staphyloma. Looks something like this. Likewise, the choroid becomes thinner toward the back of the eye. This is associated with atrophy, part of myopic macular degeneration, here represented by the pale area in the central retina. The retina, on the other hand, has normal thickness in the back of the eye, but is thin at the equator. This peripheral thinning increases the chance of retinal tear and detachment. Looks something like this. Lastly, changes in the optic nerve increase the chance of glaucoma. That is, pressure-related damage to the optic nerve causing visual field loss. These are the recognized consequences of myopia. We will be exploring each one in detail a little further along. Here are all the consequences assembled in one unfortunate eyeball. The full list includes cataract, but we will not be covering that here. We move on to how often these complications happen, their relation to the degree of myopia, and the risk they pose of vision loss. Knowing frequency and vision risk helps guide decisions about how much a myopic person should be concerned, and what should public health policy be. Harmon provides us with a recent review of myopia and risk of each complication. They use odds ratio, a way of measuring how much risk a particular condition imparts compared to not having that condition. An odds ratio of 1 means no extra risk associated. The higher the ratio, the greater the association. Our first graph shows how very strong the association is between myopia and myopic macular degeneration, extending off the chart in high myopia. Retinal detachment rates increase significantly with increasing myopia. Both of these show a pretty big jump when myopia passes minus three diopters, moving from mild to moderate. Regarding glaucoma, Low myopia shows a modest increase in risk. Here, moderate and high myopia are combined with an almost three times risk. The last one they looked at was cataract. There are different kinds of cataracts, and each has a different associated risk level. Clearly, we see an association between level of myopia and risk of certain kinds of pathology. The next question is how much do these complications affect vision? We have a pretty solid answer to that question, provided by this 2016 study, which looks at myopia and risk of vision impairment. This is the odds ratio of having vision impairment with different levels of myopia. The reference is people without myopia with a ratio of 1. We carry on our color coding. Risk of vision loss is low with low myopia, but increases steadily, roughly doubling with each step up in myopia until it reaches an extreme at minus 15 diopters. Looking at cumulative risk with age, again, reduced vision segregates according to myopia level, particularly above minus 6. As a reference point, it looks like in the mid-50s, vision loss starts to take off. It is interesting to look at the non-myope controls, the light blue line at the bottom of the graph. They show some reduction in vision with age, as expected. Now, relating myopia levels and risk. Back to our world map. The figures from Holden showed us in the year 2000, about 23% of the world was myopic, and just short of 3% was highly myopic, the high-risk group. By the year 2050, almost half of the world will be myopic, and almost 10% will be highly myopic, with all the risks that carries. 
Before we proceed further, we will use the retinal detachment data to make a point. For many years, we used a rule of thumb that minus 6 was a cutoff point for association with increased complications, particularly retinal detachment. Meaning, we could make an effort to carefully monitor the peripheral retina, discuss the risk with patients, and explain visual changes to be alert for. This graph shows that minus 6 is not a sudden cutoff. Complications from myopia increase as myopia increases. The same relation is seen with myopia and vision loss. That raises a question. At what level of risk is it worthwhile recommending extra surveillance? Given the consequences we have covered, that raises a second question. At what level of risk is it worthwhile considering preventative treatment? This is covered in video 5 in Treatment Options. For further discussion of risk level, see this often referenced article by Ian Flitcroft. At this point, you should understand about the longer eye in myopia and the basics of the related complications. From here, we move on to discuss each of the individual complications in greater detail. This is a good place to note there is a lot to digest here, so you could pick out a particular item or items you are interested in. We already mentioned that thinning of the sclera allows the eye to lengthen the basis of all the complications. How do we know the sclera is thin? In 2014, Jonas gave us measurements of the sclera for eyes of a range of axial lengths. They took 214 eyes after their removal, sectioned them, and measured the thickness of the sclera at these points. They calculated scleral area and volume. It is easiest to picture their results using a cylinder. On the left is the wall of a regular length eye. On the right is an eye of greater axial length. The scleral volume was measured to be the same at all axial lengths, but the wall thickness was decreased. And it was decreased mainly in the back of the eye. The authors conclude, quote, the results of our study uniformly agree with previous investigations in that Increasing axial length is associated with marked scleral thinning at and behind the equator. Scleral volume measurements were not significantly associated with axial length. The first myopic complication on our list is staphyloma. We know that myopic eyes are longer and the back layers are thinner than ideal. However, there can be additional localized thinning and bulging of the back of the eye, a staphyloma. Where this happens is important. The macula is the central part of the retina, and the area in the middle of the macula is the fovea, with which we see fine detail, like reading and recognizing faces. The staphyloma, or thinning, can occur in different locations. It can be relatively broad, encompassing most of the macula and optic nerve, on exam in 3D view, the increased depth is subtle. Or the staphyloma can be relatively smaller and in other locations involving the optic nerve or areas near it. The presence of a staphyloma stretches and distorts the retina and may be associated with new vessel growth. We will show you an example of stretching. This is an OCT scan of a normal macula, like taking a slice through the retina in near microscopic detail. The normal fovea has this central hill and valley contour. With that in mind, what is wrong with this picture? Aside from the apparent tent on the left, which is just an artifact. First, in the broad view, the central retina is flattened and elevated. The small arrow points to where the normal hill and valley contour should be, but they are gone. Second, there is a blank space in the middle of the retina where there should not be one, indicating the retina layers are splitting. Why is the retina splitting? As the eye elongates, a tug of war can develop. The sclera moves backwards, 
but the front of the retina may not be able to move with it. One theory is the innermost layer of the retina can't stretch. As the eye gets longer, the surface of the retina becomes elevated and may split away from the back. The technical word for splitting is schesis, making this myopic foveal schesis. Here is the same thing in our diagram eye. The arrow is pointing to the schesis area. There are two potential remedies for this, if it is thought to be sight-threatening. Both aim to arrest lengthening of the sclera. One is mechanical, surgically sewing a band or buckle around the back of the eye. The other is a photochemical cross-linking of the collagen to strengthen it. This condition is uncommon, so these procedures have limited track records. You can read more here if you wish. Of the myopia complications, myopic macular degeneration is the one with the biggest impact on vision. Myopic macular degeneration shares some features with age-related macular degeneration, but it is a separate entity. Again, thinking about the fovea, damage to this area has significant impact on vision. On the right is a microscope section of the layers of the eye wall. When light enters the eye, it travels through the inner layers of the retina, which are clear, to reach the photoreceptors, the rods and cones in the outer layer. A layer of underlying pigment cells, the RPE, supports the metabolism of the retina. When you look into a healthy eye, you see an even orange background from a combination of the RPE and the underlying choroid. The shiny reflection is from the surface of the retina. Compare that nice young retina with a person who is myopic at minus 11 diopters. Around the nerve, there is total atrophy of the RPE and choroid, which is why you see through to the bright white of the sclera. In the rest of the macula, you notice patchy yellowish color and subtle background red stripes. Here, the RPE cells are fading away so you can see the blood vessels of the choroid. Because of its importance, there exists an official myopic maculopathy grading scale. Half is based on the degree of chorioretinal atrophy, how much wasting away there is of these layers. The other half of the scale relates to other specific pathologic changes, like growth of new vessels underneath the retina. What do myopic retinal changes look like? This is a simulated image of a normal appearing macula. In myopia, the optic nerve often appears tilted and, like we saw in the last photo, may have a surrounding ring of atrophy. But atrophy can occur in other places in the retina. The pale areas represent patches of retinal atrophy in the macula. Because the fovea is spared, vision is still good. But if the atrophy involves the fovea, then vision is compromised, likely to a large degree. Lacquer cracks are weak spots in Bruch's membrane underneath the retina. About a third of people who have these will develop growth of new vessels under the retina. The dark spot is a Fuchs spot, a clump of pigment, that may be a response to previous hemorrhage. The growth of new vessels under the retina is a big risk to sight, just like with age-related macular degeneration. Because the new vessels are fragile and leaky, they leak serum and red cells, which causes damage and scarring and loss of function. Here is the same kind of hemorrhage in a macular degeneration patient, an unfortunate outcome in either case. The frequency of maculopathy increases with increasing level of myopia. In this Australian study, in those with minus 5 to minus 7 diopters of myopia, it occurs in a little over 10%. In those with greater than minus 9 diopters of myopia, it occurs in more than 50%. How does myopia cause atrophy of the macula? In 2017, a group in Singapore measured the thickness of the choroid and the sclera in patients with minimal or no myopic macular degeneration 
and compared it to those with more advanced degeneration. Here are thickness results for all regions of the eye. I have added a column showing the differences. Isolating the subfoveal measurements, the choroid was reduced by over 50% in thickness, a very significant level, whereas the sclera was mildly thinned at about 12%. We note that is different from the Jonas result. Studies don't always agree, and the authors address that in their conclusions. The authors conclude the following. From other studies, it seems the scleral volume does not decrease in myopes. It is stretched thinner. The choroid, however, thins significantly more. The hypothesis is that in myopic macular degeneration, it is not mechanical stretching, but impaired circulation that damages the retina. Let's look at the choroidal circulation, a layer of blood vessels between the retina and sclera supplying the outer retina. On the right is a drawing of a network of choroidal vessels. In ophthalmology, we have a handy tool for looking at ocular circulation, an angiogram of the eye. Here is how that works. This is my simulated version of an angiogram because I think it's easier to demonstrate the concept this way than with an actual angiogram, where appearances are subtle and it takes some experience to interpret. This is the view in before we inject any dye. A dye, fluorescein, is injected into a blood vessel in the arm. When it reaches the eye, the first place it shows up is in the choroidal circulation, the network of lacy vessels you see in the background. This early, diffusely hazy filling is called the choroidal flush. In the middle phase, the dye fills the arterial circulation of the eye, entering through the central retinal artery and spreading through the arterioles and capillaries. In the later phase, the dye is collected by the veins and exits the eye through the central retinal vein. Thus, we get a detailed view of circulation in the different layers of the eye. In 2007, this research group used the angiogram to study choroidal circulation of normal eyes versus high myopes. In the normal eye, this is the early phase choroidal flush. However, they found that patients with high myopia had significant reduction in choroidal flush. Comparing normal versus myope side by side, you can see a significant reduction in choroidal blood supply. To put a number on that, in highly myopic eyes, in 83% there was an absence of normal choroidal flush. This reduced blood supply is possibly the key factor in myopic maculopathy. Remember we said myopic maculopathy was the part that most affects vision. Here is a 2018 meta-analysis that used data from previous worldwide studies to estimate future vision loss due to myopic maculopathy. In the year 2000, it was estimated about 4.2 million people had vision impairment from myopic maculopathy. By 2050, it is predicted that number will jump to 55.7 million. Likewise, regarding blindness, in the year 2000, there were 1.3 million people who were blind from myopic maculopathy, and that is estimated to rise to 18.5 million by 2050. Number three on our complication list is retinal detachment. Of the higher risk items, it is the one most amenable to intervention slash prevention. Recall the retina is a layer of nerve tissue that lines the inside of the eye. In myopia, there is thinning of the retina, mainly around the equator. Measurement of retinal thickness as it relates to axial length has been done using both OCT scanning in microscopic sections, they measured retinal thickness at these points. The results showed that with increasing axial length, the retina thins significantly at the, at the equator while retaining about normal thickness at the posterior pole. This contributes to risk of retinal tear and detachment. First, we will show you a simple version of retinal detachment 
and then in a minute come back and explain its connection to myopia. Most retinal detachments start with a tear in the peripheral retina. There are other causes, but they are less common. The tear creates a hole that allows fluid to get underneath the retina, and that causes the retina to detach from the wall of the eye. As it pulls away from its supporting cell layers, it loses function, and in a matter of hours to days, it dies. Thus, it is a vision-threatening problem. What does retinal detachment look like? In this photo, the pale area in the lower half of the image is a detachment. The arrows mark its upper edge. These are mostly repairable. In the after image, the retina is reattached, but there is a residual pale area from some pigment loss. The earlier you get to it, the easier it is to repair. We already mentioned the Harmon Meta Study, showing a pronounced increase in risk of retinal detachment with higher levels of myopia. How is retinal detachment related to myopia? It will take a minute to explain. The hollow space within your eye is filled with a thick, jelly-like material called vitreous. It is thick and stringy like egg white. Early in life, it is attached to the entire inner surface of the retina. Over time, in everyone's life, the vitreous jelly progressively liquefies. Along with that, the vitreous jelly gradually pulls free from its attachments to the surface of the retina. As the vitreous loses its attachments, it becomes free to shift with eye motion. With each shift, the inertia of the gel causes it to pull on the places it is still attached. We use the word traction. For most people, the gel eventually pulls free without causing any problems except, perhaps, floaters. However, if the vitreous is firmly attached, and if it pulls hard enough, that can cause a tear in the retina. Once there is a hole, the liquid part of the vitreous can get through the hole and underneath the retina, and that causes a detachment. This is the most common mechanism of retinal detachment, typical in middle age. Two things happen in myopes. One, the thin peripheral retina predisposes to weak areas. Technically, there can be a full thickness atrophic hole or a form of thinning called lattice degeneration. Second, young myopes have earlier than usual vitreous deterioration, therefore more traction and flap tears. This large series of patients with retinal detachments relates mechanism of detachment to patient age, reflecting the mechanisms we just described. Retinal thinning. The orange bars represent atrophic holes and lattice as a major cause of detachment under age 40. Vitreous liquefying. Flap tears, the gold bars, are more prominent in middle age, but there is still a significant portion of those under age 40. In the same study, this is average refractive error for each age group of retinal detachment. Again, the data reflect that retinal detachments in young people are associated with significant myopia. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is the most preventable of the complications. Peripheral holes and lattice can be prevented from becoming detachments if treated preemptively by laser. People who are significantly myopic should have more careful retina checks and should understand the alert systems symptoms indicating need for prompt attention. While we are on the subject, the typical symptoms include the following. 1. Vitreous traction, that is pulling on the retina, often causes the retina cells to fire, creating what you see as light flashes, usually with eye movement. 2. When a retinal tear occurs, it often releases pigment or blood into the vitreous. You see that as sudden appearance of new floaters. Number 3. If a detachment occurs, then that part of the vision goes missing. Should you experience any of these symptoms, you want to contact your ophthalmologist promptly. The sooner you get to it, the easier it is to repair. We have reached our last complication, glaucoma. In general, glaucoma means there is a 
characteristic pattern of damage to the optic nerve. It is related to relatively elevated intraocular pressure, different from damage related to other causes like lack of blood flow. The focus of damage appears to be the optic nerve head. These again are the Harmon odds ratios. Low myopia shows a modest increase in risk. Here, moderate and high myopia are combined with an almost three times risk. In a separate meta-analysis, Marcus shows the range of risk associated with glaucoma also using odds ratio. While one study shows no risk, the other 10 all show risks with an average approaching two, meaning any myopia doubles the risk of developing glaucoma. If you look at higher myopia greater than three diopters, the average risk increases to nearly two and a half times, similar to Harmon. The diagnosis and treatment of glaucoma is covered in a separate video. How is myopia related to glaucoma type damage to the optic nerve head? This is the microscope view of the nerve head where the optic nerve enters the eye. Switching to a diagram view, axons from the retina need to leave the eyeball. How do they get through the outer layers, particularly the sclera? At this one location, there is a gap in the choroid and there are pores in the sclera to let the axons pass through. The latter is the lamina cribrosa. Once outside the eyeball, the axons join together to create the optic nerve. I've highlighted those anatomic features. At the lamina, there is a balance of pressure between the intraocular pressure on one side and the CSF pressure on the other side. One theory of the mechanism of damage in common glaucoma is that the pressure difference gets out of balance, which causes the pores to become distorted which may squeeze and damage the axons as they pass through. Looking into the eye, the optic disc is the optic nerve head viewed face on. The cup is an indentation in the center. The rim is the nerve tissue between the edge of the disc and the cup. Note the rim is even all the way around. Compare the normal disc on the left with a myopic disc on the right. The myopic disc appears to be tilted. The rim is not even, and it has a halo of surrounding atrophy. This is the myopic disc in diagram view. In the myopic eye, with a weakened sclera, the lamina cribrosa is thinned and bulges. The change in pore geometry makes the nerve more susceptible to pressure damage. Dr. Jonas proposes this is a glaucoma-like optic neuropathy. Dr. Singh discusses another myopia variant, suggesting nerve damage may be a result of internal stress within the tilted nerve head. He has followed a number of patients where their findings have remained stable. So it looks like we have the following options for myopia and glaucoma. Standard glaucoma, glaucoma-like optic neuropathy, and a structural but stable optic neuropathy. If you are interested, you can read further. That covers the main complications related to myopia. The leading theory is that these consequences are all caused by scleral remodeling, leading to weakness and thinning. So let's take a look at the sclera. The sclera, the outer layer of the eyeball, is tough and inelastic and gives shape to the eye. It is easy to bend but hard to stretch. It is continuous with the cornea in the front of the eye. At the microscopic level, the sclera is at the bottom of the section. Collagen fibers form the main structure accounting for more than 80% of the dry weight of the sclera. The basic unit of collagen starts with a polypeptide chain composed mostly of glycine and proline with other amino acids interspersed. The single polypeptide chain is then joined with two other similar units to make a triple helix. Here are three views of the basic unit, the triple helix called tropocollagen. One strand of tropocollagen 
combines with four other strands to create a small bundle or microfibril. Multiple microfibrils join together to make a large bundle or fibril. Collagen fibrils then form a layer or lamella. In the sclera there are multiple lamella, layers of fibrils oriented at different directions. They also interweave, which is not shown here. I picture the sclera as like Tyvek, the envelope and house wrap material. It has fibers of polyethylene, which are not woven but oriented in random directions. It is easy to bend but tough and hard to stretch. Remarkably, the cornea, while it is made of the same kind of tissue, is clear because the collagen fibers have a regular arrangement. That is discussed in detail in the cornea video. The sclera also contains proteoglycan molecules that control fibril structure and hydration. Elastin fibers are located mostly around the optic nerve. There are important enzymes we'll talk about in a minute. The most important item here is the fibrocyte or fibroblast. The fibroblasts essentially produce the extracellular matrix, the collagen and proteoglycans. They are particularly active in the growth phase and in remodeling. The ECM undergoes constant remodeling with breakdown of collagen by matrix metalloproteinases or MMPs. Those are kept in check by an inhibitor, tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinase or TIMP. What this means for myopia. In the eye developing myopia, the fibroblasts are downregulated so they produce less collagen and proteoglycans. MMP activity is elevated, TIMP is reduced. The result is collagen fibers are sparser and smaller, resulting in a sclera that is thinner and weaker. Thus, the eyeball increases in length and with a thinner wall is vulnerable to a staphyloma. It is thought to be the basis for the other main complications. For those who are interested, you can read further. With that, we come to the end of video number two, What Can Go Wrong in Myopia? In summary, we started with a concept diagram of a normal eyeball, exaggerating the layers a little with even thickness. In myopia development, we saw thinning of the different layers of the eye. Thinning of the sclera occurs in the back half of the eye, which allows it to e elongate, thus causing the refractive error and localized thinning is the cause of staphyloma. Thinning of the choroid contributes to atrophy, manifested as myopic macular degeneration. The longer eyeball results in retinal thinning, which predisposes to detachment, and myopia causes changes in the structure of the optic nerve, which may predispose to pressure damage or glaucoma. We have seen that the risk for developing each of the complications is related to the degree of myopia. The risk of reduced vision is also related to the degree of myopia. Projections for the future show significant increases in myopia-associated vision loss. This was video number two in our series about myopia. In video number one, we covered what myopia is, who has it, and what associations are likely to be its cause or causes. Video 3 takes us into experimental investigations, trying to understand how the eye is able to control its own growth. Video 4 follows those who diverge from normal growth control and develop myopia. We end with video number 5, exploring the variety of treatment options available and how successful they are in trials and their use in practice.